Hello and welcome to another Creative Futures session here at Glendale University in Wrexham. I'm Graham Park and today I'm joined by music industry veteran Andy Thompson. Hello Andy. Thank you. Very kind. It's just another term for old man, isn't it? I think... Um, veteran is better. Veteran yeah. is a good term. I like Thank it you. a lot, uh, being Thank a bit you. of a veteran myself. So just to let people know a bit of your background, you've been in the music business since the late 1980s. Yes. Like me, you started working in a record shop. Yep, best place. A very famous record shop. What, what was it called? Uh, it was called City Sounds, and uh, it was a tiny little old jazz and blues and soul outlet in Holborn, High Holborn in, uh, in London. Is it still there, or has it gone the way of many No, it's, it's it went, yes, uh, when online became more and more prevalent, it, uh, it disappeared, but it was... Does it still exist, though, as a brand? No. No, that's no it, it relocated to Hatton Garden in a basement somewhere, but um, like all those, the famous shops in the Soho Triangle, Groove and Black Market and Reds, you know, just no market for it. So, like me, you started in a record shop. Loads of people who work in the music business, yep. whether, whether they are um, in, in front of the mic or behind mm. the mic, worked in record shops. Um, well, you're originally from Kent? Yep. How did you end up get, work, get I, a job I, in I, London I, if you worked in Kent? I was a punter, basically. I bought records from there. It used to, there's a magazine called Blues and Soul back in the day. And uh, certain shops used to advertise the new releases at the back. And City Sounds was uh, managed by a ver uh, an ebullient character called Dave Silby, who was the manager of the shop and used to have this advert in the back of the magazine called Dave's Dozen. So basically highlighted the hot new releases. Uh, Dave was originally from Kent and he used to come down to a club that I went to that a friend of mine DJed at and I got to know him. Uh, so I used to ring up and do mail order from the shop and then as luck would have it uh, I was sort of I was doing some rubbish rep food rep job um, which I had no 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 interest in and uh, suddenly I was made redundant from that because the sales dropped not through my not through any fault of mine I don't think although I wasn't very good right. and I was meant to be up in London uh, looking for a job but of course I went record shopping walked into the shop just on exactly the same day that his assistant, the one and only Nigel Wilton, who you remember, I do remember got Nigel, poached yeah. to go and uh, work for Island Records. So he said, Andy, Andy, I can't believe it. I've, Nigel's just gone. What, what am I going to do? And I'm like, suddenly, light bulb went on. I went, well, I'm not working at the moment. Let me come in. And I'd no, I'd never thought about working in the shop, certainly not in a music shop, but I had a real interest in... Uh, in the music, I had a reasonable knowledge of it. You're, you're a bit of a soul boy, aren't you? Kind of. Uh, I sort of, yeah, I got into the music because a friend of mine had a sound system that he ran uh, where we grew up in Kent, but he he was actually in the business and got a really good reputation for putting in massive rigs, a bit like that. JB, in fact, he worked for JBL. Uh, I mean, he might still do, I'm not sure. Um, for soul festivals and big gigs in um, around the southeast, and then he combined his uh, his skills with another gentleman, and they put they put the sound in for one of the rooms at Caister, which was like the legendary mm. um, soul festival in uh, in Norfolk. So, because I didn't, I was I don't know, fifteen, sixteen. I couldn't drive, but local village life wasn't for me. So I used to help him every Saturday or wherever to to take the gear out to these events so I could just hear music and I, it soon became apparent to me that I was attracted to sort of London and you know music nights rather than just going down the pub and having a fight. Yeah so you're, you you're into the music but yeah. did you did you want to pursue a career in the no. music industry? No 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 I had no idea I had no idea what I wanted to do but after six months of working behind the counter mm. at City Sounds we had a lot of record company come, people coming in who used to use the, the shop as a source for new music um, because it used to import uh, um, American house music over. And the record company people were coming into the shop using it to find talent, to find new material that they could license for their UK company. And I just, I mean, I quite enjoyed it for a few months working behind the counter, but it suddenly dawned on me that these people coming in used to park their BMWs outside and get parking tickets and then spend £400 on, on, on records that they would expense. 
didn't have much of a clue. Uh, and it also, I, I realised... yeah. yeah I, I, I also realised that there was that quite a few people used to work at the shop who went on to work for labels, including my predecessor. So I suddenly thought, this might be quite good. And um, so I, I had a couple of interviews, didn't quite work out, but... So did you, did you apply for jobs or did you ask if any jobs were going? No, people were, come to me and went, do you want to, do you fancy coming? And I wasn't quite sure. And then I, then I thought, well, yeah, maybe that's the path to follow. And I knew Pete Tong quite well because he was a Kemp boy originally. Mm -hmm. And my friend supplied the sound system for quite a few of his gigs, so I knew him to talk to. Um, but he used to come in the shop, he and Jeff Young, used to come in the shop um, to find... To, see if there was any like new releases that had arrived from America before their radio shows because they wanted to play, you know, be as current and as new as possible. And I just used to kind of get to, I got to know Pete even better and Jeff as well. And used to, if two copies of a record come in, I'd save one for them. Now they, <laughs> they, they would have like tabs up to about 500 quid, which the, my manager in the shop hated because he just yeah. wanted people you know, rather than saving records for for them, he'd rather just flog them to someone who'd come in. So I just d developed a bit of a, a relationship with them. And then I used to go up uh, on a Saturday night after the shop and go and help Pete and do the, the phones on the show at Capital Radio. So then used to travel about. So I, I basically just bored him into submission and go, look, give us a job, give us a job. Because I quite, obviously... Was, was he already at, at London? Yeah, he was it? running London Records and he just started at uh, FFRR, which was the dance imprint at London Records. And straight away, it was when Chicago house music was exploding. And he, but he'd had, he um, signed Love Can't Turn Around, Farley Jack Master, which was the first, I think the first house music number one and um, Jack Your Body, Jack Steve. Your body. Yeah. And he was at the forefront of this. So I could, I, I guess the mercenary sort of underpinnings of my character realised that there was money in all this. So, so, so basically, you, you blagged a job in the record shop. Totally, yeah. And then you blagged a job at London Records. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the, the record shop was just opportunity. It was sheer, you know, being in the right place at the right time. But, yeah, the record company thing, yeah, I kind of, because I didn't want to work in a shop. For so the you started of off running the club promotions department. Yeah. Which, which, uh, which basically, for people who are too young to understand yeah. any of this, yeah. you used to send people like me white labels yeah. and promo copies. Yeah, we had mailing lists of DJs, which I inherited. I first went in there as Pete's assistant. Um, I don't quite know how he created that job because it was quite rare. And then a bloke called, um, a guy called Johnny Walker was there, who you remember, mm. who got an opportunity to work elsewhere. He was doing the club promotion. That's right, that's right, I remember. So he went virtually as soon as I got there. So they said, oh yeah, the new boy would do it. So I didn't have a clue what I was doing, but you basically, you had a, a mailing list of, of DJs You'd sign records, they'd get pressed up uh, a, a plant in Slough, get sent to a huge distribution centre owned by Polygram, which is now Universal, in Chadwell Heath. And there'd be this team of people who would, uh, you'd produce, print out stickers, send them to Chadwell Heath, they'd put them on mailers, put records in, wallop, and out they go. And a lot of that would be club DJs, but there'd also be radio uh, people as well. And yeah, you just facilitate a sort of mail out. Uh, within these records, there'd be a, a do you remember, there'd be a, a piece of paper, sheet. a reaction sheet, <laughs> and your job was to get the DJs to fill in the reaction sheets and post them back. Or fax them back. Or fax them back, which you can, well, which you can only imagine was just a blight on their lives. But come on, I was very good. At you were very it. good. Yeah. You were very good. But there were a lot who didn't. But you needed to glean a reaction to how well these records were going down then try and get some specialist Friday night local radio play. And the whole idea was to garner a pre-release buzz on this release. So the salespeople at London could go to the, the shops and get a pre-order. And if the pre-order was good enough, the record was to shoot, used to shoot from nowhere into the top, top 10, top five. And if it went in high enough, you had to, all of a sudden, you're faced with a dilemma that you had to, you had to create an act for Top of the Pops, which was the sort of the panacea of all mm. achievement. If you got your, your song on Top of the Pops, boom, you're but, off. But, but not every record that would happen, not, sorry, that wouldn't happen to every record. No, 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 no. Um, but then we were very fortunate in as much as um, another form of 
exploitation, if that's the right word, developed because the, the, um, the compilation albums turned up. And not just the now albums, the big pop ones, um, Polygram, um, of which London was sort of kind of part of, created this series called Dance Zone. And there was myself and two other guys, uh, Nick Raphael, who now runs Capitol Records, and has developed Sam Smith, Five Seconds of Summer, and uh, Paloma Faith, who's done brilliantly well, and Christian Tassisfield, who went on to run Warner Records. They created their own little label as well and signed Baby D, Alex Party, Wigfield, uh, and things like that. And all of a sudden, London were, were discovering all these hit records. And so uh, Polygram and London Records jointly developed a brand called Dance Zone, which was the forerunner of Cream Presents or mm -hmm. Dance, uh, uh, or all these big super club ministry, it predated the ministry albums, um, the annuals and things like that. And all of a sudden, London were making pots of cash out of this because the singles would be signed, get to the top of the charts, and then also um, about six weeks later, there'll be a compilation with all these on, and they would sell up to sort of quarter of a million, some of them, and wow. they were just huge cash earners. When phys physical sales were, you know, were making the majors more money than they are now. So, I mean, it's completely different to how it is today with, with streaming. Oh, it's, I was thinking about it on the train on the way up. Every four or five years, there's a, there's, a, there's a game changer, like the whole playing field changes. And I remember when CDs turned up, then Napster and the whole download thing, uh, and then iTunes. And then uh, the last three or four years, streaming and Spotify has become, you know, astonishingly prevalent in as much as you're looking to get secure music on playlists, all, which kind of almost uh, becomes paramount over actually selling physical copies or downloads. It's ridiculous because the industry has found a way to monetize, you know, a, a high turnover of, of streams. Yeah, but... What about the artists, though? You said the industry's found ways of monetizing it. Well, in, uh, that still filters down to um, to the artists and the writers, not probably as much as they would wish. And there's there's been a few things come up online in the last few weeks about people, you know, proclaiming that uh, it should be the deal should be a lot better and, and in the favour of that. But they, they, there's arithmetic. There's sort of algorithms that present. If you've got a big song, if you're Lewis Capaldi or something like that, the amount of mm. uh, plays and streams, he, you know, I, unfortunately, what I can see, what I, from my, from my, uh, my perception at the moment, if you're right up there, it is incredibly lucrative. But mm -hmm. breaking in and trying to make money out of, out of getting your music streamed, first of all, getting onto the platforms is difficult enough because there is a surfeit of, of product out there. But then getting from there to there is incredibly difficult if, if you're just on your own. So, I mean, what advice would you give to people who want to make music? Because if you go back to like the late 80s and through the 90s, mm. what you were doing was physically finding acts and yep. signing them and yep. often giving them money, yep. and then doing the promotional thing. Yep. And if it became a hit, investing more. Yep. So people like you would invest money in mm. artists. Mm. Now there's more artists less record labels and anyone that don't need record companies really no. they can do their own thing what advice would you give to someone who's perhaps got a unique sound or talent what route should they go down well whereas before you when i first started you needed a label or someone who ran a label to provide a platform for your your music um now the, the surfeit of music that's out there is, is great because it allows anyone really to produce music and then go to um, a distributor, uh, AWOL or, um, was it not Disco Kid, one of them. Is it that you can basically get someone to put your music up there, but then the problem you have, and they will take your music to YouTube and these other, all these other platforms to, to, you know, that will air your music, but the issue then is that how do you then get from there to the next stage without investing more money? And I think it's a double-edged sword. It's great that you can get your music out there and you can get it heard, but it's how you get the net to the next step because 
there is so much music out there and the, the, the means by which people are listening to music now, which nowadays is more tablet and phone led than it is buying a vinyl and going home and put it on your record player. The, the turnover and the speed of transition between different apps is, is mind boggling and you have to try and capture an audience somehow. So I think you've got to create a device by which you grab someone's attention and make you listen to, make them listen so, to your, your music. It's tricky. So if it's so competitive, and mm. then it's all down to technology democratising the music making yeah. process, um, do you think that in that case, you, if you were to be signed to a well-known label, that, mm. would, that would be to your benefit rather yeah. than do it yourself? Um, yes, no doubt. But then the question being is how do you get yourself to the attention of that label in the first place? When I first started, people used to press up their own records mm. and go around the five or six record shops in London, or if you're up north, used to go to Manchester, Liverpool, Moorington, Blackpool, and drop little white labels in. You know, now you, you just literally have to make the recording, get distribution from one of these companies who will do it all for you for like a 10, 15% cut. But then the, the, the dilemma being is that it, you're one of, 35 million pieces of music and you've got to work out how you so then you have to it, it, retrospectively go back to the way it's always been done you've got to try and get people to listen to your music who are in positions of influence be it you know radio stations or um, advertising agencies or things like that you've got to um, work every angle you can think of because otherwise if you just think yeah I'm, I'm, I've got it up on Spotify and that's it job done but you're, everyone else has got their music up there and it, it, it's, it's um, trying to elevate your, your music and your art to a position where more people can absorb and enjoy it. So even though it's possible to just on, on, on a Monday morning open your laptop on your own, make yeah. a piece of music and have it online by the end of the day, yeah. um, you can't really do it on your own. You do need... It's tricky. Like uh, uh, at the end of the day, there's enough people at major labels whose whose talent scout operation, whatever you want to call it, A and R. I know there are some labels who have just got like open offices full of kids just sitting there, surfing the net, going through new music and this, that, and the other, and working out why is this recording got more chances. I'd like to think that quality will out. This I'd, is this is major labels or big big labels. Yeah, but the. But independence as well. I mean, I, I, I'm partners in a new label and we, you know, we, there's certain areas that one of my, my partner's a DJ, so he gets a lot of stuff sent to him. But I'm out there listening, still listening to Radio One or, you know, Hype Machine or there's various things online that, that you know, will tip music. Um, <coughs> but it, it's, it's tricky because the, I, I, I think it's great that, you can get your music heard and it's not so much not you know so much snobbery with regards to you know is it good enough to be heard but mm. it, it's simply you know putting your head above the parapet and going my, actually this is my my stuff is better than that and this is why you should listen to it well just going back to your career after the being like club promotions manager yeah. of London, you became A and R, which is like the the, the, the person who signs yeah. acts, right? I, I, I think, yeah, I was. But, but I'm just gonna compare that to how you were saying there's labels with loads of kids just yeah. listening to stuff. Yeah, that's the A and R process today, is it? That's the the start of it. I guess so, yeah. Because what what's happened now? You go to Universal, some of these major labels. They they are they've stepped up their. Um, personnel recruitment to the point of um, the recording industry is one of those areas where a lot of people um, deign to try and join. They, they, they think it's an attractive proposition. So these major labels have um, graduate schemes or they have, you know, uh, work experience or whatever they have. And they, they've got people with sort of, you know, you know, first degrees, firsts, like in incredible um, intelligent people starting at the bottom and just running around. And they will do anything to um, get their foot in the door because that's half of what it is. It's mm -hmm. like you've got to get in and then work out what you want to do and just blag it a little bit. But I know a lot of these A&R departments literally got 
open offices with about 30 people on computers just surfing the net trying to find stuff. But how does that compare when you started doing a in the 90s? Well, my, my version of it was to get out and go out and visit the record shops, which were the traditional sources of, of stuff. And um, I was saying to your colleague earlier that I the business was very London-centric then. And, you know, you a lot of my contemporaries were just going around the rec London record shops and thinking, well, if it's hot there, it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be huge nationwide. I realised quite quickly that there's a big old country out there, and mm. the more I travelled, the more I found. And you know, some of the gigs I did with you, and you know, we used to once a month regularly get a car, drive. Uh, we had a tour of all the Northwest record shops: so Blackpool, Bolton, Warrington, Manchester, Liverpool, Blackburn, and I'd come back with about. 10, 10 plastic bags for the tunes that I would never have found down in London, never. And most of them I signed and they were, turned out to be pretty successful. But, uh, but I realised that I had to make the effort to go and find these. Now, nowadays, it's just the press of a button. You've got to have the skills in going to certain sites or yeah. certain um, radio shows or whatever that you think, well, these guys are be on it and if you're a music maker you'll want these guys to play your music so if you're an a &R scout you go and check their shows or you go and check their site or this that and the other um, so I think it's probably a little easier now but once to you've been an A&R person I think you can get your foot in the door whether you're then given a senior role and you're allowed to sign these records and invest a, a fair degree of um, money into them because still then you've got to go and see the band play live and the same rules apply. You've got to, you know, if it's a four or five piece band, rock band, they're, mm. they're, they're doing their own thing, you've got to go and see them perform. Ultimately, you've got to go and see them. I, I've just um, signed, or I'm about to sign to, to our label, um, uh, an act called The Pressure. And they make great electronic dance music, but there's a bit of an edge to it. The lead singer wants to be Dave Garn and, you know, David Byrne and I had the demos really liked them I was a bit lucky because I knew the guy's dad <laughs> oh, right. who, who got me to meet them and then I went and saw them play live they did a gig in in London and I just thought it would be two young guys you know one with a microphone the other behind like load of decks and this that and the other and it would be quite not visually made but Harry the singer got out and had this alter ego on stage and he started interacting with the audience and I'm thinking, well, well that's, that's good. But I thought all the, the audience were all his mates because he's, yeah, come nearer. And, he, and I thought, that's great. And I spoke to him afterwards and I said, well, that's, I didn't think you had that in you. That's really surprising. I was really encouraged. And I said, uh, did you have all your friends down? Did you like a black man and come and dance? He went, I don't know anyone here. What? He just did it. So the same rules, same. So we now we're about to put out a couple of EPs, and they've got a gig in London on Saturday. What are they called? The Pressure. The Pressure, right? And um, I'm really excited to, to, to go and see it because not only is there, are their music great, I think their music's great. They write new songs, and they take all sorts of different influences. And my partner hasn't seen them perform live. So on Saturday in this little place in, in Hackney, Hackney Wick. So like 150 people there, and it will be great. I'm going down there on the on the premise that I know what it's going to be like. So, so, so I'm really excited. So they're seeing them live. Did that tip the balance for you? For yeah, but, them? Uh, I probably would have signed them anyway because the music and the and the songwriting was really really strong. But they had ambition. Talking to the boys, they they, they told me the people they were really into, and I could see there was a huge um, gulf between, you know techno electronic music producers who just are happy behind a mixing desk and mm. putting stuff out to those who want to go and play live but these guys want they, to play they live they perform they want to play live and they came out with two like matching dickies boiler suits and harry who's this mild mannered really polite public school boy just just he has a stage presence mm. so it really excites me that the fact that i know where they want to be right and you know back in the day when these acts started coming out of dance music um, not many had the presence of mind to provide a visual representation. Mm. You know, Orbital, Faithless. Well, exactly, just watching all Top of the Pops. Well, yeah, that. it's filth, isn't it, yeah. half of it. I mean, some of them are <laughs> ridiculous. But if you look at 
people like Orbital and the Chems, who are still performing now, they're like, right, we're not natural showmen, but we're going to de develop a visual presence. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, slides and visuals. And the fact those two are still performing nowadays goes to show just how good they are. But from my point of view, finding someone like The Pressure, I think it's it could be Underworld. It could be um, to have a lead singer. Okay, so 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 what you're saying then that it's the, really encouraging that, that if you're going to have a be serious about a music career or, or yeah. making music, you can't just concentrate on making music. You have to do the you, live thing as well. You you can. It's there's no point trying to force someone from behind a desk to go and. No, but I mean, sing. if you want if you want to really be successful, uh, it's it will be a lot easier. I think the rewards are obvious if you have a band. Not banned, but you can go out there and perform. I mean, look at, I remember seeing the Prodigy for the first time in Bristol and I loved their music. And then I went and saw this, it was a Radio 1 Sound City thing. And it was just, goodness me, it was a game changer. It was like punk, mm. electronic punk, whatever you want to. They came out and I was just like, God, we, you know, we, I was working at London and we had no one like that at the time where I just thought, they're so far ahead. So, for my mind, if, someone, if, if someone's not a natural performer, their thing is production, that's fine. And that they can, you know, achieve their goals in, in, in the way that they're comfortable with. But if, I think if you've got someone in your group or band that is a natural performer, they want to get out and perform, they want to sing. So, if you get someone like that, the world's your oyster. So, um, about your career, uh, you, you moved from London Records to Virgin yep. uh, in the 2000s and ran, yep. ran things there yep. but, and had a lot of success there. But then you went on to become a music publisher, right? So instead yep. of finding records to sign, you were working with singers, songwriters yeah. and, and singers. It right? was a different, it was funny. It, it was, um, I, we had great success at Virgin, but with most, most companies, there's peaks and troughs. Um, by the end of about 2000, um, dance music was the, the, the polish was start, yeah. started to wane a little bit. And um, the people who achieved huge success for Virgin started to get one by one get nicked. The main two people went to run Virgin America. Mm -hmm. And some people were brought in who just didn't kind of understand what we were trying to do. Our, my job at Virgin was twofold to sign hit singles and to fuel the, the compilation department, which was the guys who did now and all the different derivatives. And um, so we had a, <laughs> um, a guy who ran Source Records in, uh, for Virgin France, who illogically had an office in London. I don't quite know how that worked. Because he was super cool, uh, our, the MD of the company needed a head of a &R, so we got him in. But this guy just didn't understand our market. He, was, he wanted to sell records in Hoxton and be on the front of the enemy and be super cool. So I remember sitting there with my colleague playing in these tracks and go, right, these are the ones that are commercially viable and the ones that the compilation department do really well with, but they're a bit cheesy. But these are the ones we really love. So we're doing both. And he's like, his face was like, I remember playing him a, it was a good little pop song, quite trancey, but not, you know, won't, won't be remembered in 30 years time, but we just, it was about to get into the top 10. He's like, oh, what is this? This is devil music. And I'm just like, really? And I, but we explained to him why we did it. Anyway, so that, the bottom, the, that was the end of the line. So I, I left and uh, I didn't know quite what I was going to do. And then... Um, that was that tough. So you'd worked since a young yeah. man and suddenly you were Yeah, I, I was aware that, that the area that I was in... Did you get a payoff? Yeah, yeah, I had to pay my I had a year's salary out right. of it. So, so you were all right for a while. I was all right for a while, and I decided to, I decided to have January off because mm. I thought it was quite a good idea. Then I got bored by mm. two weeks. I was having coffee and listening to radio. So, so you set up Nero. Well, I did. No, no, I did Universal. I got a call from oh, the, right. I got a call from uh, Mike McCormack, who now runs Universal Publishing. He asked me to come do a six-month sort of a paternity cover. And uh, I'd never done music publishing before, and I what's thought, the, what's the difference? Just a kind of layman's term. What's uh, the difference well, a, a label you you're responsible for sourcing and monitoring, just getting the the track or getting the music through the system to the point of physical release. So, 
once you've got a hot track, you've got to go around the company and make sure that the artwork's done, video if you need a video, talk to the salespeople, get the marketing right. And literally, you've got to keep your eye on everything until the thing's released. And then if it's released, it's a big hit. You've got to you know, get the video right, maybe do some performances. So you're there from literally yeah. from the bottom of the food chain to the top of the food chain. Music publishing, you deal with the writers of the, of the music some of which won't perform, some of which will... I did a lot with Rob Davis, who, oddly enough, was in that glam rock band, Mud, Mud. back in the day. Great none band. of this lot will know, obviously. I think there's but, somebody um, will know. He ended, up, he ended up writing Can't Get You Out of My Head, with yeah. Kathy Dennis, for yeah. Kylie. So yeah. was, and then did uh, Tok Fragma's, Toker's Miracle yeah, Fragma. Yeah, yeah. Did loads of top lines. So he used to sit in his, his studio in Kent, and all the big dance records that were uh, instrumentals needed top lines. So Rob, you just used to go to Rob and he used to write these brilliant, really good. He did, did he do Spiller? I can't remember. Anyway, yeah. he did loads. I think he did Spiller. Yeah. And um, Groove, yeah. So part of the job, uh, after six months, I was doing all right. So they asked me to stay. I ended up doing eight years there. But it was more creative and you're dealing with either writers who were just studio-based or bands that wrote their own music. So do you sometimes put two people together? Yeah, 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 yeah quite. I like what you do, I like what you do, Yeah, but it could be better. Because that's what you did when you were a, a label, that's what you did, you put people together and try and create something out of it, and or you, you signed a big hot trance record back in the day, but it needed a vocal, so you put it with someone. So it was, it was quite a natural evolution for me, but different rules and different games and, you, you're not you're not at the at the coal face, and you've, you're reliant on other people to a certain degree. So then you would set up Nero. Yeah. Was that a label or publishing? Or it was or? a it was both. It was just some. I kind so did of, you leave Universal and set yeah, up Nero? Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> foolishly, I, I did. I, I really enjoyed Universal, and I branched out into different forms of music that I hadn't really done before. Some pop. I signed a guy called Scott Matthews from. Uh, Wolverhampton, who's like a sort of country soul blues troubadour, and we won um, we won an Ivan Novello with an amazing song, um, which is not, which title forgives me uh, evades me, but that's um, elusive. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. and um, so I went in all different areas, and the last thing I signed of note, along with my colleague Dougie, was Adele. <laughs> wow! So when Adele's I Adele's publishing. Adele's publishing. Now I left a year, I just got bored. I, I went in my office and the guy that I work for did business in a certain way, not Mike, the guy above that. And it got more of a chess game and strategic when I wanted to get my hands dirty. And um, I was an idiot, because had I stayed, I mean, Adele just went bananas and I can't even sit here and compute how much money uh, universal music publishing and still does it's astonishing so with hindsight i could have sat there got in and got a raise off my existing <laughs> boss and ended up having a ruck with him because he, he would have tried to work it against me or i could have got a move doing the same thing for another company um but i was just bored i wanted to go back and sign things so yeah i went out there and started the label we had a couple of little one-off hits which we licensed and then foolishly i started I got a couple of offers f to consult. Um, Warner was run by uh, a guy I used to work with in London, started at FFR again up, and Pete Tong reached out and asked me if I wanted to help him, so I did that for two years. And then for that finished, and then I did some stuff for Island Records for three years. And in hindsight, I should have built up the catalogue more for Nero, mm. because once Spotify and uh, the other the streaming platform started to gain prominence, you earn money out of having catalogue of mm. 30, 40, 50 songs, because they just generate, all of a sudden started generating income, was it? which I didn't, because I was getting married, and I needed, yeah. you know, when someone offers you like a, a regular consultancy, you think, well, what am I gonna do? And so, yeah, that, that was my mistake. I should have just got my head down and concentrated on the label. So where are you right now? What's, what's, uh, what well, are you doing Well, uh, Nero doesn't really exist. The two people I, I did it with have sort of gone on for different things. And I was kind of running it um, just because we had some catalogue that was doing all, all right. But I've just started a new label, Foundation Music, with a um, very cool uh, DJ producer and manager 
a fellow called Ross Allen, who Ross has uh, brought DJ Shadow into Ireland. Um, DJs got incredibly good good taste in stuff, uh, and of late managed London Grammar and a and would their first album and did really well. He worked that with the, the late Jazz Summers and did brilliantly well. And um, we've, we've signed three or four acts, an amazing jazz singer called Lady Blackbird out mm -hmm. of LA. We're doing The Pressure, the guys I told you about earlier on. We've got some one-offs and it's really exciting. We're at the coalface finding new music and then, like I said before, coming to the point where which all the other music makers are, and producers and label heads are, whereby we're hit with the conundrum of how we, we think we've got great music and how we get it to the next level. We've got a distribution deal with ADA Warner and they will help you mm -hmm. sort of distribute and send stuff to YouTube and all the other providers. That, um, but we, we're faced with the same you know, dilemma of who do we work with to uh, highlight the stuff we've got. So what advice would you give to any of the students here who like might end up making music or maybe currently make music and want to try and get it signed rather than do it themselves? Um, well, I, I think you've got to become aware of the mechanics of initially releasing it yourself, getting it out there. Uh, but I don't think the rules change that much. You've got to be passionate. You've got to be totally into what you're doing. You don't compromise. And you've got to look people in the eye and go, this is really good. And this is why you should sign, not sign it. Or this is why I believe in what I'm doing. And this is why I'm better than anyone else. And have total faith and belief that the music you're putting out there is as good as you can make it. And the good, you know, the positive thing nowadays is that, you know, technology is so much wide, more widely available. And what you can do at home and the software mm. and the, what you can do on a laptop is, you know, years and years ago, you just had to get in a studio and, and blag some and, studio and, time. Yeah, and, and it would cost a lot of money. As exactly, well. and financially you couldn't do it. Now you can do so much. The, can, you, can you take a punt more than you used to? Because like in yeah. the past, you'd have to get a budget from someone above you. What, if you're a music maker or you're a label? No, I mean, if you're a label, you used to have to say, can I get 10 grand to give this person to go in the studio? Yeah, because... Whereas now, you can say, well, if you... I'll, I'll pay for your software to, to, to do yeah. something. It's I mean, most like people... quid. I'll give you most people, quid. Yeah. Most people now are, um, are able to... They've got the software and the... If they've got the talent, they can produce music you on, their, the passion, on their own to a very high degree. But you, what what you got to understand is that to let to create opportunity for more and more people to hear the music, you've got to be driven, and you've got to understand there is the marketplace is so sodden in in not not necessarily comparable quality, but it's just deluged with so much music out there. You've got to look at yourself in the mirror and go, is this as good as I can get it? Do I really believe in this? And do I think it's better than everything else? And then just use that passion and drive yourself and just find a way around the maze and get your music heard by as many different people. But you still need the old break, don't you? Along the way. Yeah, I'm a big believer. And if you get that break, like yeah. you and me yeah. both find ourselves blagging things, you grab that. I'm a, big, I'm a big believer. I think everyone gets an opportunity and you've just got to have the wherewithal to recognise that opportunity. Like, you know someone who works at an advertising agency who needs some music and mm. they don't want to pay much for it, but, it will, you know, they want to... Um, it's a platform to get your, your stuff heard. Um, get to know someone who's really au fait with the, you know, the digital world. Try and be sneaky and try and get your music to places. Social media? So Well, without a doubt. If you've got someone who's, you know, who's on Gram or something like that who just... You know, and I, I, it's got a huge amount of followers. Blag it. Go and go. Can you? Next thing you do, can you use my music? You won't get paid for it, but um, it might be a stepping stone. Oh, absolutely, stepping stone. You've got to just any little niches that you can find and 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 uh, get your stuff into. Do it on the basis that you won't you won't necessarily earn out of it initially, but it will open other opportunities. Right. Yeah. Let's see if we've got any time for a couple of quick questions from the audience. Anyone got a question for? Andy? No. Does that, that mean I've you, covered everything? That means so, you've covered everything yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in your inimitable style. Okay. So very briefly, what's the future hold for you and for the music industry? Because it's changed so much in the past 
few years. Well, I've sort of gone back to basics and this label that Ross and I are running, um, we're just enjoying working with music that we really, really like. There's, given our experience and, and uh, the, the people that we know, we're naively believing that if we make the music as best we can between us, we can get it to the places whereby as many people as possible can enjoy it and it will create success and income that we can reinvest into new music. Um, the industry itself, uh, I'm, I, I think the, the next game changer will occur. Spotify and these and some of these other platforms have got a lot of power and they have a lot of influence. But I think right now there's a few people questioning their, their modus operandi and the financial benefit of working with them. And I think there'll be some cracks appear. Okay. And then we're waiting for the next thing, whether it's the phone companies, the... But nobody knows, because like, nobody could predict it the past no, 20 years. No, I, I, I imagine the people at the major labels are already looking, you know, beyond the, ne you know, around the next corner and going, you know, the streaming services at the moment have got us by the Googlies. What, how can we get <laughs> around that? And it's, it's whether or not... It's interesting that Universal and Warner are already starting to sell shares in their company and outside investment from China and other such places um, are starting to come in. So you'll start seeing some of the major labels who at the moment want to supply music to everyone all and sundry. Right, OK. They'll suddenly be curtailed because, you know, the Chinese company that owns 10% of Universal have a partner that they will ensure that. So it's going to get messy, I think, for a little okay. while. But the great thing is that... There's still people like you doing well, stuff no, you believe more, in. More importantly, there's still real... And this country is unique in many ways for its diversity and, and, and talent. But the, the we've always... And I, I still I see no sign in it abating the desire and passion for music. So people will always make music and, you know, you lot and all the people you, you, you involved in will want to find new music and there's a mm. hunger and a passion. And that will all, I think this country is quite unique and it will always create um, talented people producing music. And I think it's just finding a way to let people hear what you're doing. And as, I, I, as long as you can, I think where there's a will, there's a way. If you think your music is better than everyone else and you've got a real passion for it, you'll find a way to expose it. And um, if you do that, I, th I believe there's, there's always people in this, um, in this country who will Brilliant. scoff it up. Okay, fantastic advice. Andy Thompson, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you.